Thank you very much for the introduction. Um, looking forward to, um, to close today, today with a, a brief presentation around how do we establish a competitive environment to really drive the innovation required for our future energy needs. It's, um, it's an interesting subject, and I think uh, some of the things we already touched upon early in the day by in the panel discussion as well as by some of the other speakers. But really, over the last few years, the world has become a very, very interesting place when you think about it from an energy perspective. It's for a long time, of course, dominated by hydrocarbons, but we've seen two things happening. On the one hand, very much so, renewables get into price points that put them in the same ballpark as hydrocarbons. And more importantly also, because of COVID and the demand for oil going down so much, we've seen basically the RRI on projects in the oil and gas space reducing significantly and sometimes even getting below the ones on renewables. So there are a lot of changes and a lot of things happening in the industry, but is that enough to actually support the energy transition and to drive a more environmentally friendly future? And, and this is needed not only because of the, the economic side, but also because there are significant pressures all around the world to change. Um, particularly, and, and that's something I think in this form, which is interesting, is, is the investors. We, we've seen companies like BlackRock, the, the, the Norwegian Sovereign Wealth Fund, actually not wanting to invest anymore in hydrocarbons. Similarly, we see um, governments and also NGOs pushing for an energy transition, for a more sustainable uh, future, less of a carbon footprint. And of course, also consumers. Um, significant changes there also at the moment um, around the world with people really not traveling anymore. If that is to the office because they're working from home, as I am doing myself today, or if it's not traveling, no vacations and so on. And, and this is important because things are changing, but there are a lot of discussions around renewables. And we've seen some of that actually flare up recently in the US and Texas. It's or not all of it necessarily based on facts, but you see that the energy transition is for some people also a very emotional transition. It's a change of behavior. It's a change of the, the old world and also a change of above all a different way of thinking. And when we look at this from a Middle Eastern perspective, if we look at what does it mean really from a strategic as well as operational perspective, it's, it is not that obvious. And we, and many of the people here in the audience are familiar with some of the challenges we have when we want to build and operate a solar farm, for example. It's the weather tide dust as we have here in the Middle East, as well as um, the occasional rains actually create tremendous operational issues to run a solar farm effectively. At the same time, also strategically, there are some challenges. Is It's a market in the Middle East where, with a very, very high penetration of hydrocarbons, of conventional resources, of energy. It's questions around the grid. Do we actually have the grid infrastructure from an electricity perspective to support it? As well as some of the questions around the energy security, the balance, the, the trade-offs, because nobody wants to be um, ending up with barrels in the ground and not having maximized their natural resources. To, to really drive the energy transition in the Middle East, um, and this comes, by the way, from a report made um, before COVID by IRENA, the Institute of Renewable Energy, um, and I would really recommend all of you, if you're interested in this space, to, to read the report, um, particularly because what makes the IRENA studies interesting is that they, they don't look at the world from a Western perspective, which, to be honest, a lot of the work, of course, gets done primarily in the energy transition at the moment from a, a European perspective. 
and it's good to see um, a different view and also some of the nuances. And, and one of the key things here is, and there is a lot of operational things, but also how do we drive innovation? And I know it has come up today earlier already around energy distribution, but also a distributed generation possibility. It's in some ways, if we want to create a more effective and a more innovative market, the monopoly um, that currently exists in each of the Middle Eastern countries for the government when it comes down to renewables and renewable energy is not necessarily the way forward. It is extremely important that we create an environment in which there's actually real competition. This competition will drive improvement, will drive innovations, which is essential when we want to move this market forward. And that is important because and, and we we talk often about innovation and when you especially and I'm, I'm myself an engineer is when you talk to engineers about innovation, they will talk about the technology. Which is important, but there is a lot more to it than just the technology because innovation in our perspective is really the creation of a new business offering and that is can be around re-engineered products or services or extended products, but there's also digitalization elements. There is additional services on top. The, it's the full business offering where you really can make the distinction. And to do that, it's as an organization, any organization, if that's either at a governmental level or at a corporate level, needs to think about like, how do you create that transformation? And it starts with like actually setting that agenda. What are your objectives? What do you want to achieve? And this is not about lots of little things. This is about a number of real aspirations, really bolder initiatives. Then there needs to be clarity around how you manage that portfolio. It's particularly when you talk about something more digital innovations, you will hear people talk about uh, fast fail. It's like figure out what works, but if it doesn't work, stop doing it. Then designing and scaling it and really also um, fueling it. And one of the things that we've seen is that it's very difficult if you have large corporations with large operations to really build that innovation, build that offering out uh, as part of the uh, your portfolio if there's such a heavy weight still done by your core business. And that's important because we distinguish, distinguish effectively three types of innovation, which is kind of the core, really, how do you optimize your current portfolio? Adjacent ones, relatively, they're new, but they're close to your core business and then truly transformational ones. Um, our research has shown that normally you put about 70% of your investments in the core, 20% in adjacent, and 10% in transformation. That's what it should be. But then actually when we asked, and this is an example from, for example, the oil and gas industry, we asked people, where do you think you should be? They actually, they even want to be more transformational. The problem though is when you then actually look at what they're doing, is very much not the case. And the current situation with COVID, the current price point has really not helped that transformational investment. So there are a lot of the investment, a lot of the activities are still very much in the core of the existing business. And even, and that means that even though a lot of the oil and gas companies, for example, are talking about investing in renewables, being part of the energy transition, they're not necessarily, when you look at the numbers, are doing it to the extent that they would aspire to. And as I said earlier, it's innovation is not just about the product. Uh, we make a distinction, we call this the 10 types of innovation framework, where, where we basically say, okay, you have at the core, and that's the, the boxes in orange, the, the actual product. This is where the engineers come in. This is where you improve like the tech, technical um, 
qualification characteristics of your products or services. But the real challenge is to actually get other dimensions of innovation. And that can be on your profit model, your network, the way you, you structure it. It's to even the point of your channel, your branding, your customer engagement. And it's important because the more of these innovations, these types of innovations you combine, the more difficult it is actually for people to copy you or compete with you. Where we've seen um, people that invest only in, in one of them, and particularly when it's on the engineering side, they get outcompeted pretty quickly because it's easy to copy. To give you a bit of an example of and what this is, and this I put here some uh, some examples that are not only on the, in our industry or in, but really across the board, and and where you see that innovations are done on many many different fronts and combinations of these, and I think that's the key thing to to realize is when particularly in renewables now, the it's not only establishing the generation, it's also thinking about storage and distribution, thinking about new client engagement models, about new ways of creating new profit models. All of it needs to change. And as a result, significant opportunities exist in markets where private players are allowed to operate, to create that innovation. And that's important because when we ask people in the industry, in energy companies, where they all admit, and that's the um, the bars, the importance of each of these different elements. But if actually when we ask them, it's like, how good do you perceive your company to be? They very much said so that on the configuration side, when you think of a profit model, network, the structure and the process, they're not as good as they want to be. So in a way, they're unable to leverage all of the dimensions to innovate and create value for uh, their stakeholders. But how do you do that? How do you actually now attack each of these 10 types of innovation? It's we basically identify um, 12 critical levers. And it's important to understand, and it's, those are the scores at the bottom, is how energy companies actually perceive themselves. It's one comes down to clearly an approach where there's an innovation strategy, there's pipeline and portfolio management, and there's a process how to move from ideation all the way to the business lounge. Although it's the highest score, it's still, and it's important to understand this is on a five point scale, it's still pretty low. And what we see with a lot of organizations, and we've seen that with the energy transition, we've seen that with digitalization programs. It, it's almost like throwing ideas at the wall and see what sticks. At the same time, if we look at the third pillar, resource and competencies, yes, these things are in place, but it's still very modest. And it comes also because the major investments as shown earlier are still done in the core business. The real areas where we need to improve as an industry is around the organization. So the engagement of our leadership, the way we govern it and how we also collaborate and collaboration I will talk a little bit more about in a minute. And then lastly, the metrics and incentives. How do we actually stimulate innovation? Because if it is about only RRI, a lot of the existing business will do better now than the more risky innovation. But it's all about balancing that portfolio and assuring that you have different elements in your portfolio to really be ready for today's business, but also for tomorrow. And what energy companies are doing as part of that is really innovating through partnerships and collaboration, it's, which is very different than a lot of other innovations that were done in the past, which are very much companies on their own. If you want to innovate, it is often done in an ecosystem or a cluster, but you can't do it all. And that means you collaborate governments with corporations, with universities, with um, NGOs, all of them coming together to actually 
managing um, the innovation. And that really sets also the, the fit for purpose approach for an organization and resource and companies and metrics, depending on the type of innovation you want to do. It's transformational ones need a different approach, need different kind of people, different funding model than when you're talking about more core innovations. So in conclusion, um, what would we suggest going forward? Is one, innovation will play a very important role and even a greater role than it has in the past to drive the energy transition and to create significant value for customers, shareholders, and employees. Two is portfolios need to be evolved and be rebalanced. We need to look beyond product innovations we need to collaborate and nurture an ecosystem. And we need to think about specific strategies to really drive the transformational innovations. Be bold and set up a separate structure and a separate approach. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure uh, presenting this. And I want to wish you all a great day. And thank you for attending today.